Hello, everyone. My name is Ian McDonald. I'm with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, and I agree totally with Charlie's comments there, and they bleed directly into what uh, I want to talk to you about this afternoon. And so uh, we started a compaction uh, journey in 2017, bringing up a couple of guys from Ohio State, Shear and Fulton, to talk to us. And then we brought a fella from University of Bern in Switzerland who was doing a lot of compaction work, Matthias Stettler. And I want to show you some of the results from what we did. <clears throat> so, you know, if you've got manure, that's fantastic because manure is such a great resource, but it also puts pressure on the system to um, compact the soil. And so as great as it is, there's things that you have to be conscious of. And that's the fact that manure is heavy. It is low nutrient density. So to make value of it, both in terms of the time of getting it out and in terms of the nutrient value on a per acre basis, you got to deal with high volumes, which again adds to the weight and the number of trips across the field. And oftentimes the application timing associated with when manure needs to get out is at a time when soil conditions are suspect. And that's the, the biggest threat to the potential for soil compaction to occur. And so um, I think it's important to remember that we talk about soil and I refer to dirt as dirt, but our farm field soils as soils because they are a living biological system. And just think about, you know, sticking 500 pounds of weight on your belly, that's gonna hurt, that's gonna impact things. It's the same with our soil environment. So, you know, how do we treat it better? And so during our compaction journey, we've done a lot of different things and we've come up with this list of ways that you can address soil compaction. And I haven't prioritized them here in terms of what's the best, but I will say that <clears throat> being able to add more than one of these best management practices is better than, than only doing one. And <clears throat> that you know, as much as you work hard to offset compaction, you'll run into years like the fall of 2021, where it just never stopped raining in our part of the world. And so, you know, everything took a, a beating when manure went out this past fall. One thing that's interesting from the practical work we've done, and I'll show you some of that in a minute, is that we've sort of uh, segmented different types of farm equipment into categories or risks to compaction. And surprisingly, considering the weight of manure, the amount of field traffic with manure, manure spreaders tend to be on the better side than maybe you would expect. And I think it's because over time, and as the equipment has got bigger, uh, farmers and manufacturers have recognized the amount of weight and they put more rubber under these tankers than uh, has happened in other implements, as I'll show you. And so um, any one of the things, piece of equipment that's on this list can be moved in this list as a function of the decisions that you make on tire size, <clears throat> the technology in the tire that you buy, the inflation pressure, and then when you're out in the field, the weight and speed at which you operate. <clears throat> and this is an important slide from a conceptual perspective. And think about the change in farm equipment from the 60s to the, to the 2000s. And you know, we know that farm equipment has got bigger, but when they studied it in terms of other aspects of it, they found that um, despite the increasing weight, the tire volume, so the, the, the size of the tire that was going on that heavier equipment was bigger. <clears throat> and so that is positive. The problem is, is that as you put bigger tires on and more weight, you have to have more pressure, which bl blows the tire up taller. And it means that the footprint, the, con the contact area is reduced. And so <clears throat> relationship wise, as we've gone through time, bigger tires on bigger equipment, <clears throat> but not the same percentage of contact area. And that's very important. <clears throat> Implements of the 60s, could do the same amount of compaction relatively because the weight was in relation to 
the um, amount of uh, size and weight of the equipment and in those days, really essentially poor tire technology of today uh, with everything being biased tires. And so we need to find a way to manage the tire volume to get more contact area. And so we started in 2017, repeated in 2019, and then we hosted the 2021 North American Manure Expo this year. And this is uh, uh, pictures from there in August at Listowel, Ontario. <clears throat> so what we would do is we would pick different types of equipment. We would fill them up with manure to their capacity and weigh every single tire. <clears throat> and then my bright young uh, engineering colleague built this uh, contraption that allows us to put three sensors into the ground. And this is the sensor here. So it's put into the hole that these different rods produce into the soil. And it allows us to insert these sensors vertically right over top of each other at 6, 12, and 20 inches of depth. And then we lay that out and we set ourselves up. And when we have an audience, we have the audience out here. We're back here. Here's the, the gizmos put into the ground. You can just see the sensors there. In this case, we had a dry pit on this side and a wet pit over on the other side. First time we've ever done that where we've purposely gone out and wetted the soil because we're doing this in August, which from a soil condition perspective is probably best case scenario. <clears throat> so then what we do is we get the loaded equipment and we drive it along and we drive over those sensors. And you can see we draw a line with orange paint to have the tractor go down and we're trying to center the tire on this round circle right here. So I'm going to show you a series of graphs associated with different configurations of the equipment. So I just want to explain the chart layout, okay? <clears throat> so up at the top, it tells you what the chart or what the implement is and what the tire size is and what the tire pressure is. On the uh, left axis or the y axis, we have soil pressure. So it's not compaction, it's pressure. <clears throat> and it's time on the x-axis. And this would be the front tire of the implement, the back tire, sorry, front tire of the tractor, back tire of the tractor, and then the two tires of the implement. <clears throat> so you would see a pressure response of the tire in the graph. The green line is the six inch probe, blue is 12 inch, red is 20 inch. <clears throat> we have two threshold levels here based on the European data. We're trying to stay under 14.7 PSI. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> at the six inch uh, sensor and under seven and a half PSI at the two deeper sensors. <clears throat> so here's the first piece of equipment I wanna show you. <clears throat> and it's a noon uh, quad tanker with uh, tandem sets of 30.5 LR32s. And you'll notice that we have these lines here and that's our uh, central tire inflation system. So we are able to test this in the wet and the dry pits at the road pressure that would need to be 28 PSI based on the weights. And 16 PSI is what we could run at in the field because we're going slower on a softer surface. <clears throat> so here's the first uh, graph. This is from the dry pit. <clears throat> this is from the wet pit at the road pressure. This is the tractor tire. And this is the first uh, uh, quad tanker. And then I missed the, the graph here. But <clears throat> so in the dry soil, you see the uh, level of response at the different sensors. And you'll notice that it's worse in the wet soil than it is in the dry soil. So drier soils, better than wetter in almost every condition. <clears throat> then we tested it at the 16 PSI pressure on the wheels and look at the difference in the response that we saw regardless of whether it was dry or wet soil. <clears throat> so lower PSI is better than higher and drier is better than wetter. <clears throat> and then I put them together just so you could see them all together. And so 
here's under the road pressure and here's under the field pressure in the dry scenario and the wet scenario. And the difference is very visual. <clears throat> so then the second implement I wanna show you, excuse me a second. is this uh, tanker that's equipped with two different types of tires for demonstration. So we've got a set of um, 30.5 LR32s like the last one and a set of 18.4 38s. <clears throat> this is the road pressure in each case and the field pressure in each case. <clears throat> so run them across the sensors. This is the large tire at 25 PSI. And again, in the drier soil versus the wetter soil, you see that that amount of weight uh, shows up regardless relative to the tractor, but it's worse in the drier soil, or sorry, worse in the wetter soil. <clears throat> and notice that it's mostly in the top six inches. We're not getting near as much difference in the um, 12 and very little in the 20 inch, mostly because the soil under is, is drier. And so then we take that same tire, put it at the field pressure at 12 PSI, and again, look at the response. <clears throat> then we look at the 18.438 tire, much higher pressure because it's a smaller tire volume carrying the same amount of weight. And so it makes for less contact patch that the um, going across the field. <clears throat> and again, dry soil versus wet, worse in wetter soils, and they, they're creeping up compared uh, to the bigger tire. <clears throat> but when we drop to 25 PSI, which is the road pressure of the bigger tire, it has a significant impact in reducing the pressure down into the soil. <clears throat> so this is our sort of piece of resistance. We call this the rubber railroad. It has 12, 900 tires on it that are carrying, you know, 7,000 kilograms of weight. <clears throat> and we run them at 40 PSI and at 10 PSI <clears throat> that a central tire inflation system allows us to do. <clears throat> and this picture is always scares the living daylights out of people because that is an acceptable amount of deflection based on the technology of that tire and the weight and the speed out in the field. <clears throat> and so what does that look like? Here's at the 10 PSI, here's at the 40 PSI, which would be what the road is. And so if you don't have a central tire inflation system, you have to run at 40 PSI all the time. And so this is the damage you would be doing continuously when the wagons were full. And again, it would decline as the wagons emptied out. But notice the difference when you can lower that pressure, it's, it's, it's huge. So we've really come to the conclusion that, you know, regardless of how good the tire is that you have, whether it's larger, whether you have more tires, whether you have um, <clears throat> lots of frequency moving to the field and you're traveling long distances, it really makes a difference to apply a central tire inflation system. <clears throat> and, and it's really important to think about it as footprint. As you lower pressure, that tire gets longer. And so you put more uh, square inches of rubber on the ground. <clears throat> and so just to conclude, this is a little demonstration that we did with that 18.4 tire. And at the 55 PSI versus 25 PSI, we painted the outside of the tire with a sheet. And again, look at the difference. It's quite significant and very impactful in terms of the compaction potential. And so I will leave it at that and uh, turn it over to Linda. <clears throat>